so um, to have that possibility to to listen. Um, a little caveat is that I am uh, for the longest ni- time now I've been uh, at the final stages of my PhD. Um, <laughs> so um, I don't know how you guys felt when you were doing that, but um, that you very often feel that you have no idea what you're talking about and that everything feels that you're in the beginning of everything. So um, this presentation is um, one I've not done before. I've not tried, I've not reflected on it this way uh, before. Um, So we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm a researcher at the Weizenbaum Institute and do my PhD at the Design Research Lab in um, the University of the Arts in Berlin, um, but I'm now a guest researcher at the KTH in Stockholm, so living in uh, living in Stockholm, where I'm originally also from, um, and uh, yeah. I have a very interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary um, background because I was never planning to to research um, until about five years ago. So um, a lot of, of the research that I have done and what I will present today as well is going to be part of things that I was doing, not as a researcher, but as a um, civil society actor, and activist, and so on. Um, my PhD centers a lot around the concept of urban digital sovereignty, which is a very difficult um, concept, I think. Um, I started in 2018, um, and since then, just the term sovereignty has become so, just in the last year, uh, with the Ukraine war, feels very difficult to to use that term. And I think it was peaking there around um, 2016, 18, uh, and then it got a bit of a bitter side note. But I will go into a little bit about how I have looked at the concept and what I've tried to to pull out of that concept to at least make it uh, work for what I'm um, researching. And um, I will also try to talk about the different roles that we are having when we are researching in these kinds of settings, um, the role of translator uh, between different epistemologies, different cultures, um, the constant in betweenness of, uh, of academia, uh, your activism, your political goals, and so on, and also bring in the idea of discursive alliances towards. Um, as a means of politicizing technology and making technology understandable. Um, So I'm going to see if I can make this a little bit smaller so I can see it better. There. Oops. Um, Technology production has always had a very special place for cities, and um, starting with the Industrial Revolution, which was recreating urbanity in its core, and as well as today with digital technologies. And the rearrangements of cities through data-driven technologies, platforms, centers, sensors, etc., are rearranging the way we think of governance, politics, power asymmetries, and the relationship between democracy and capital. We have uh, smart urbanism propagating forms of data-driven oversight of city governance and the operation of city services through digital infrastructures, and now also uh, platform urbanism, which is is to its core resembling ownership ownership systems, labor markets, and much more. And all of these systems are ubiquitous, they're everywhere, but the technopolitics behind them, so the power and the profit and the intent behind these technologies are difficult to see and grasp. So how can we start understanding the interests, imperatives, and impacts of these ubiquitous technologies? And I think this is probably now the research question of my PhD. How can we start um, how can we start um, making technology understandable to start a, a, a democratic conversation? 
And making these dynamics visible, legible, tangible is a prerequisite for practicing urban digital sovereignty. Um, and because cities are the main sites for experimenting with new technologies, I think it's really important to also see these as sites for the experimentation with forms, new forms of empowerment, reappropriation of technology, and the enforcement of democratic conversations about our uh, digital futures, and starting to th rethink um, digital policy. So, um, what do we actually mean with this term? It's a very normative term that has been um, able to serve as a projection field for a broad spectrum of actors. Um, Couture and Tupin and Lambach and Opperman say, calls it a rhetorical, it has a rhetorical performativity that shares a rough understanding of digital sovereignty as autonomy, self-determination, and security. I really liked uh, your definition of tech um, sovereignty, and I'm going to look into how, how he describes it more, or she describes it more. Um, but all of these different ideas of digital sovereignty diverge in their specificity. So whose autonomy, who will safeguard it, against what threats, um, and how should, it, by what measures should uh, digital sovereignty be reached. Lambach and Oppermann, uh, Oppermann say that digital sovereignty is not an empty signifier, but so many different concerns and ideas are attached to it that it's not far from becoming one. But they also argue that digital sovereignty as a concept is not successful despite this diversity and understanding, but rather because of it. And if we understand the concept as normative, uh, we can start filtering out the different narratives it seems to depict. I'm not going to go into this very deeply, um, but I can say a little bit how I, s how I got engaged with this concept from the beginning of, uh, um, of, under of how I felt the word uh, sovereignty at the time in 2016 to 18, uh, where I was relating it more strongly to uh, um, food sovereignty and that entire narrative of not just food security being... Uh, you, ha you have access to food, but actually food so sovereignty where you ha are managing and have power over the, so the food production uh, to be able to, to ensure that you have food. And that's how I thought digital sovereignty was, uh, was meant. Um, but in the last five years, this term has very strongly gotten related to territory. Uh, be it on a national level or on a supranational level, especially, especially in the EU and especially in Germany. So uh, this, as, as the Via Campesina uh, example, um, this narrative of digital sovereignty is understood as digital self-determination and uh, autonomy through collective control. And it's increasingly articulated by civil society and entities of global social movements. Um, this narrative um, sees digital digitalization as a positive and a way for communities uh, of community empowerment, but only if the technology is controlled and managed within the community ecosystems themselves. This is not the main strand of understanding for digital sovereignty at the moment. It's more the territorial form of digital sovereignty where the enormous power of corporate actors that thrive in the, in the commercialized digital environment holding the material and immaterial power of owning vital societal structures has given rise to a new structural and expansive thinking about the domains of democratic self-control. And this is the most prominent category of digital sovereignty claims, specifically in Germany and Europe. Uh, so it's about state autonomy and self-determination of states towards other states um, and states' forms of, of protecting their own democracy. Uh, one form that I find very interesting um, and that I've used a little bit more in my PhD is the understanding of digital sovereignty as democratic digital sovereignty. 
Um, here it's understood as democratic self-determination and democratic control and accountability of the digital. It is a narrative that is seldom on the center stage in the German or European discourse, but often lingers in many policy documents and civil society conversations in their understanding of digital sovereignty. It stays vague, but here we find demands of public participation and decision making on digital policy. We find critical popular education, digital empowerment, and the need for protective regulation. Um, in this narrative, we've left the external sovereignty idea, so the sovereignty towards external powers, uh, and also towards other states and their companies. Um, the, uh, it's instead, it's it is that the state's accountability towards its citizens to ensure that their will is being served, so the will of the people. In this narrative, the digital is seen as a risk and digital technologies are undermining the rights of workers, consumers, social security and democratic citizenship. It's very focused on the individual, specifically the citizen, um, as the holders of digital sovereignty that must be protected and the state is responsible for safeguarding the rights of its citizen, therefore the act are the actors of digital sovereignty. Um, with this very divergent understanding of digital sovereignty, um, I'm seeing, or my hypothesis is that the term can be used as a sort of a boundary concept it has the interpretive fl flexibility to engage with different stakeholders, but, it, but this interpretive flexibility makes the concept a poor guide for policy making. It can be used to legitima legitimize various policies, but offer very little guidance for actual policy choices. Its main value lies in politics as a useful tool for organizing political coalitions. And with this idea, I've tried to um, filter out some themes and measures found in different digital sovereignty narratives that can be used on a municipal level. Um, but digital sovereignty is never described as a static state, but rather a continuous process. And uh, I tried to make an analogy uh, to Brenner and Theodore's statement of actually existing neoliberalism and Sh Shelton, Sud and Wick's adaption of the actual existing smart cities it might not fit perfectly yet, but um, I got stuck a little bit with this idea of trying to look at actually existing digital sovereignty. A lot of aims of digital sovereignty pertaining to territory, specifically in the global context, will not fit in the city, but key themes can be used uh, on a municipal scale as points of possible coalition building. I'm um, not going to go much deeper into this right now, but I hope we can discuss it more later if we feel like it. Um, but look now more into the, the actual projects that I've been working on. I'm going to present two projects that I've been involved in directly during the last several years. I counted seven years, which was scary. <laughs> um, and also as well as some research that's just happened on the side um, to open up the conversation on roles that I found myself within community engaged research. It is the role of a researcher as the translator, intermediary between different people, epistemologies, institutions, and languages. Um, so, sorry. This is the first project I want to present. Um, this is a project I did not as a researcher, but as a uh, heading an organization called Common Grounds. And it was a research project called MAZI, which means together in Greek, and was a Horizon 2020 EU-funded research project involving nine partners from four European countries. And um, the idea with this, with this project was to use community networking technology and uh, wireless networking technology in non-tech savvy uh, groups to try to understand. Uh, so we were interested in community networking technologies and the goal was to get non-tech educated people to think of logics we know from the internet, like Wi-Fi signals, for example, but also social networks and the cloud as something that we can build, uh, own, manage, and design ourselves, and above all, use them locally. So we call them local digital um, uh, do-it-yourself networks, meaning they're not connected to the internet like Wi-Fi or Freifunk, but, but are small 
hyperlocal um, internets. And the guiding principle was to address the problem of alienation and access by, by designing a toolkit that provides low barriers for participation by using affordable off-the-shelf technologies and shaping an inclusive terminology and dis discourse around the design of the prototype. The initial iteration of the toolkit was designed using open source components including Raspberry Pi and SD cards and the software was developed in part by the project partners while integrating existing free Libre open source software um, to create plug and play installations allowing for an easy to use local digital network with some preset application. But the toolkit was not just this hardware software device, but it was more also looking at or we were, um, these technical elements were accompanied by documentation of the use cases and experiences, so a lot of storytelling of how we got engaged with these communities uh, and other physical materials such as posters, guidelines and storytelling pamphlets. And all of this became then the MAZI toolkit. So the, the question we were asking in the project was, what does technology look like when, when it's conceived and developed in very local contexts? What can neighborhood technology look like? And how can technology development, or how, can, how do we need to design technology development to make these kinds of engagement with non-tech uh, people possible? The project was divided in different pilot teams. We had a pilot team in Berlin made up of myself as a community partner and uh, my colleague Andreas Unteidig from the University of the Arts as the academic partner. And my role um, at that time was to make the bridge between this technology, this research project with the communities we were working with. So that was uh, tenant movements, um, socio-ecological uh, projects like urban gardens, like the Prinzesslingarten, which I was also part of, and the Neighborhood Academy, which I was part of. Um, yeah, and this was the biggest problem of this project, obviously. I think this, is the, the big, this was the biggest question for me, at least, in this research project of how can you engage these kinds of community into, into technology. And this was very clear that First of all, these are communities that are working on their free time. They have a very clear, clear um, political goal. Uh, these political goals are also very dire and very uh, pressure, under a lot of pressure of stopping people from getting displaced from their homes, um, for example. So how can we do a research project with them where the research is actually adding value to their work? and not putting extra pressure on, on their work, as well as, yeah, how, how that, I think this was the main priority for me, at least in my, in my role at that time, of um, creating a situation where this was important for them and not just because it was an, a research project for us. It was, of course, the most difficult and we spent about a year doing so where we were just looking at possible common grounds between uh, critical urban activism and critical technology discourse. And here was the place where we found this common ground where we can, uh, within the movements, within the right to the city movements, we're talking about property and ownership of land and real estate or the public management of city development, so questions of who decides what is a livable city or who decides where to get lives, who gets to live where. And that connecting these to similar to topics when it comes to critical technology discourse. So question of property, ownership of digital infrastructure, software, and of course data played a prominent role, but also the control of the design development and implementation of these technologies. So for what purpose are they made? Who profits from them? <coughs> and who are they including or excluding? And I, it was through this very long um, and slow process of building this discursive alliances that we made the MAZI project possible to collaborate at all um, and to integrate this kind of technology into, into these communities. And that was also became um, part of the research um, design. Hello. 
uh, of always working on these two levels, so working up on an operative level and working on a discursive uh, level. And throughout the project, the roles uh, of us, so me and, and my academic partner, so the community partner and the academic partner, and already you can see that this is a, was a very clear divide that existed. Um, what we felt when, when we were working together that was that we were in constant, or our, our role was as, as being constant translator, translators. We were at either translating um, from the research project, as we said, we were what we were going to do from an EU level to the ground, what makes sense on the ground, and how do we add this value uh, for the urban initiatives. This had to be, of course, in the first room. So it needed also to be translated back to the European Union, why we were doing it this way, why it was taking much longer, why, um, why this organic growing of the project needed to be the way it was. It was also in translati translation within the pilot team itself, so between me as the community and my colleague as the university, to understand and be transparent about what our intrinsic motivations were. So the different sets of values and currencies that we had, like for me at that moment, community credibility, the long-term tr trust, the political motivation of my work uh, on the one hand, and for him, the fulfillment of the project, creating research data, making publications, scholarly rigor and, and such things, and being very transparent about that with each other, but also with the people we're working with. And it was also um, the translation we were doing working with these communities. So it was translation between the, this building of these discursive alliances, um, but also being all of a sudden in the role of being the tech people. Of, of course, we were not, but, but we were then at some point um, becoming the, the technical support for several of these initiatives. And there's a lot of unpacking here, and there are thankfully two papers written on this, so I, I will show you them uh, a bit later. A second project um, that I will talk about is the Digital City Alliance or Bündnis Digitale Stadt, which I then initi initiated once I was a PhD researcher. Here I had shifted from, from, from the MASI project uh, working and asking this question of how can we politicize technology and how can we make it understandable for non-tech communities to shifting the focus upwards of saying we need um, municipal government to engage with us on these issues and how can we make digital policy um, democratically negotiated. Um, and the Digital City Alliance was a network of civil society organizations and academic organizations. The ones that started us, so me and, and four others, all came from this urban movement um, arena. And we wanted to try to connect the digital to these questions and um, demand public participation within a speci specific policy document that was being developed, which was the digital Berlin's digital strategy. We tried to attain as much information about the strategy as process as possible, since it was uh, completely untransparent. And for the first two years, only three public documents existing, uh, existed that at all mentioned the strategy process. So two years of the of the process of, of making the strategy itself, it was completely in transparency. And we also developed several demands through the process. Um, one demand was uh, for the city to start integrating digital political education in neighborhood resource centers, such as family centers or neighborhood libraries. Um, and we called these Keats Labs or neighborhood labs for digital political edu education. Um, so it was about creating local centers to build digital literacy, uh, but also education surrounding di urban digitalization, critical technology, community-based technology development, and so on. We did not put this into practice as an alliance, um, but I, I was um, heading this space that you see here for six months, uh, just opening up a space for two, t two days a week um, and inviting a lot of 
people or just telling about the space and saying this is this is the setting it's digital it's urban do something with it and it was everything from self-help groups uh, exchanging ideas of how to protect yourself in, in in the internet to these kinds of installing or um, parties uh, but also making dinners uh, and discussing um, uh, different digital policy issues a second demand uh, which we also decided to implement as an alliance was the institutionalization of a long of long-term participation or at least a pilot of this kind of institutionalization and we did this by installing a round table for digital policy physically based in the House of Representatives in Berlin and we invited representatives from the Berlin government and administration together with experts and local initiatives and organizations to discuss specific digital policy issues. Um, we've had two roundtables thus far, on one on, this, on another strategy called the Smart City Strategy, which, is, which has now been merged with the digital strategy, and a second one on the re-municipalization of the city website Berlin, Berlin.de, which is until recently privately owned. Um, yeah, there were a lot of successes and a lot of failures of the Alliance during the three and a half years that I was engaged with them. They still exist and still work, um, but yeah, we can also discuss that later. And here was, of course, the, the role of being smack, of placing yourself in the middle between different stakeholders, so civil society, academia, political administration. It was the role of researching for the initiative itself, so getting a lot of information, making it public. It was, of course, researching with the entire uh, digital alliance. Um, uh, so, yeah, that was also a way to make sure that the research was always giving this added value back to the communities. Um, I'm going to make a little... Um, nudge on the side, how much are we on time, because I did not look. Time. Yeah. So it was a lot of the focus is looking at how we can find new language, um, new languages of understanding uh, technopolitics. And here you see uh, languages that we do understand. We understand um, urban movements, we understand um, right for the city, we at least know what the slogan means. Um, and how can we start creating that kind of a language uh, beyond or for the, for the digital city? And I think some of the examples that I showed now already show these discursive alliances. Now I just want to show some other examples which I think are really interesting uh, where this is happening um, or where this happened as well. This is a very prominent example. No, I was not directly involved with the, with the upcoming examples. It was the fight uh, against a uh, Google campus that was supposed to open in a very contested space in Berlin, uh, in a neighborhood where people were already very active uh, uh, against gentrification in, in that certain street, actually. And when that, those initiatives started engaging uh, against the Google campus, a lot of um, techie people came along because all of a sudden there was a, a joint enemy, which was Google, of understand, of for the techie people just not wanting proprietary platforms and their data extra extractivist um, practices <laughs> to take over, they started joining these movements to show what, how Google is actually working. Until then, the, the protesters were just seeing it as a very uh, rich, new tenant that was going to gentrify the, the neighborhood, but with these two working together, all of a sudden they started um, sharing a lot of new, or creating a lot of new new language, and creating also these bridges between uh, between two worlds, so to say, and out of that came also a lot of, of um, new initiatives of these techie people showing the city people <laughs> how to how to protect, protect themselves um, more, how to use open source software, and, and so on when, they, when they're organizing. A second one is uh, uh, also another fight against the building, which is the Amazon Tower, which is uh, now placed in the middle of Berlin. 
And this also started as a political campaign against gentrification, but it became really quickly, it surpassed this border, uh, quite literally actually, because um, these, these activist groups started directly looking at what kind of a company is Amazon? How do they work? Who is working for these companies? And they started making uh, tours to Poznan in Poland, where the entire logistics centers of of Amazon that are delivering things to Berlin are, are placed. So they were uh, talking with the logistic workers in Poznan to understand their working conditions and so on. Um, as well as coming back to Berlin and engaging with a lot of the platform worker struggles that they were finding there of different bike riding uh, workers uh, and such. So joining forces um, and, and building this alliance, uh, discursive alliance between these two struggles. These are of course a lot, and we, we see that a lot happening now with um, tech workers' demands where all of a sudden unions are starting to understand what the digital economy is doing to labor and, and trying to merge these two um, uh, strategies together and creating very different kinds of unions. Um, or cities that are implementing digital sanctuary polity, uh, policies to protect illeg illegalized migrants from being surveilled, incarcerated or deported by making constant and continuous data collection in our lives visible. So they're, they're trying to use as little data as possible to make sure that uh, illegalized migrants cannot be surveilled. Um, so for now, I just open up, I think, a lot of conversations, but I hope we can uh, keep on talking, to them, uh, talking about them in the question. Um, and here are some... I just felt really bad because I saw how you did it, where you had the other people, the other authors as well, not just your own. <laughs> <laughs> but I just show my own now. <laughs> um, but because I think that, um, yeah, they unpack a lot of, of what I was uh, trying to talk about today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to discuss you for this uh, great talk. Thank you for sharing your thoughts uh, and the projects that you work with and about. Um, I thought that was super inspirational, and I've been always been looking for an alliance like you founded here in Hamburg, um, where I'm mostly based. I'm at the Lefana University in Lüneburg, and I'm currently uh, researching Amazon, um, the company, and it, it's uh, urban impact um, and how it's running a sort of infrastructure uh, throughout the city uh, in various um, yeah, departments, basically. Um, yes, thank you so much. I think you had so many interesting questions underlying what you were uh, telling us uh, through your case studies and everything. And I think one that resonated very much with me was, uh, who are we talking about? Who are we talking to? Who are we in our, you know, our positionality and um, in the fields that we work in and with, and also who are we between the positions that we call researcher, but also activists and people that are politically involved and want to be politically involved, also take responsibility as researchers. I think um, you talked about that beautifully, and um, I'm curious. Maybe you can elaborate on that a little further. Um, how you manage to find the language. I think translation is such an important uh, topic to talk about, uh, especially from a, a methodological perspective. And I always find when different uh, disciplines come together, it's like having to find a new vocabulary and having to find a new language together. Like this is the basis. And also being able to name specific inequalities and power structures and everything. Um, to be able to point at them and maybe unpack them or maybe just deal with that we can't unpack them in a way. So I'm curious how you, how you manage that and also maybe um, how you did what you um, described or what I would kind of maybe call a sort of code switching between different roles and disciplines and backgrounds and stuff like that. Um, I thought that was super interesting um, also considering 
the local knowledge that was involved, which is also an interesting question. Should we translate everything, or should some things maybe not be translated to, yeah, not make communities vulnerable, um, which is like a, I think a big discussion also with indigenous, uh, indigenous knowledge in the US right now, or uh, North America. Um, which also brings up the question of authorship, for example, which we uh, saw with you as well. So, um, yeah, maybe you can talk about this a little bit more. Who's involved? Who has the time to be involved? Yeah. Involved also as us researchers. Um, and uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I think let's start with the who has time to get involved. I. I I think this is what we bring to the table when we are paid researchers. We can bring the time, uh, and I think this is this was also a way um, for me, at least, to to work in the Digital City Alliance was to take a lot of the responsibility also on myself because I knew I have the time. This is my research now, so I can do all of this uh, painstaking work of uh, putting up the web page and. Uh, like uh, this caretaking work that's that's time consuming and um, uh, yeah would would take a lot of resources if everybody's doing it uh, on their free time um, and I think this is was always a, a way also when we were doing in the Mazi project where we knew we are being paid because we have this EU funding so of course we're going to do a lot of the things so that you don't have to do them and try to to make our funding <laughs> work for you, not only the, the research that we're doing but also the time that, that we're being paid for. Um, to, to create these languages I, I think the main strategy was hanging out a lot and spending a lot of time and going to things that were not part of my research but was part of their work or our work, uh, um, yeah, and uh, creating that 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 language through that, and or or bringing up the topic in different kinds of discussions to see what kind of a new language uh, uh, comes out of that. This this other question that you're saying about how what n what are we not translating? That was very very big a big question in the Mazi project, for example, because. The technology in itself was very interesting in that point where because the technology was local and hyperlocal, everything that was shared on this technology would stay there, for example. And this became like a vehicle to start discussing what kind of knowledge don't we want to share? Do we only want to share with the people that we're spending time with in this room or in this garden or in this garage or wherever? Uh, so that became a really interesting like conversation of, of understanding that especially in Berlin when we're talking about um, free spaces, where do we find these free spaces, uh, who is being displaced, all of these kinds of information that is definitely not going to uh, not going to be translated outwards because they're dangerous for people. Uh, um, it was a great vehicle to make that very clear, to, to, to make that line very clear. I love how this also translates into coding and programming and everything. I think code is an actually <coughs> very interesting, not only a thing as in like computer code, but also in thinking through like social codes and uh, um, things that are implied within that, that word as well. So I think it's great that mm -hmm. you pointed to that we actually have to translate that too into how do we do our digital practices. Also as researchers, do we use Google or Amazon or can we stay away from that? How do we treat the material that we gather and everything mm -hmm. uh, implied to that? It has like a huge, um, uh, yeah, how do you say, Atenschwanz? Tail. <laughs> Tail, yes. Yeah. There was something I was going to say. Oh God, my mind is playing tricks on me. It will come back. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Comments, thoughts? 
I'm not in digital public at all, <laughs> just an uh, urban researcher. Um, because you mentioned you've been involved in this project years before, and then in this other one with Bündnis Digitale Stadt Berlin for some years, now not anymore. So often it's a problem how does researcher, the peer of the researcher of the field, like entering, how do you get in contact, but also as I understood, you're not active anymore. Yeah. So how did you manage? Uh, to, to do that. Yeah, uh, I'm still active. I'm just okay. not the speaker of the okay. of the of the network anymore. Um, but um, yeah, this how do you end research? I think this was also um, very. I mean, I would start again with the Mazi project because Mazi was so clear defined as three years. Uh, this is when we got the funding, especially f for me at the time, being a community partner means that I have funding exactly for this period. I don't have funding after that. So the exit strategy uh, of, the, of, uh, of the project was something we discussed already from, I would say, maybe half year into the project especially when you're creating technological artifacts or, or any kind of uh, te technological tools, how do you create any kind of maintenance of those tools or, and so on. And I, this, this one uh, graph there uh, was a way to try to think about that, of, um, of seeing that what we leave behind might be parts of technology and parts of this technology do still exist and, and keep on and survive without our doing. But it was very much working on this discursive platform of saying we are building now a community with all of the people that we're working on, a community that have all gotten engaged with digital, a critical digital discourse and fr from, from micro um, situations. So we were also making a lot of, of um, meet meetups and things like that where it was just about showing that we, this is about the group of 30 people that are engaged with it and where we can keep on helping each other, maybe not with Masi, but how to like set up the next cloud server or maybe we can do our own ne next cloud server. So it was trying to build a network that would stay beyond the research itself. And which is the same with the Bündnis Digitale Stadt, which is also a network. And it was also clear that this has to work also when I'm not there. And it has now been working for one and a half years in a slightly different way, but, but uh, it's still there. Yeah, but I think this exit, exit strategy is incredibly important. And now I remember the point I wanted to say to you, which was, um, uh, I think Berlin is very exceptional, especially the communities we were working with, very exceptional in that they are so critical towards research. They have already experienced so much research being done on them. Uh, so it was very easy to start the conversation mm -hmm. of saying, so we're researchers and we know you don't like it, so how can we like deal with it? Or at the moment I was not a researcher, but, but, but so I think this is also how, what level of, uh, yeah, how, how these, like their groups and their groups, this, these groups were very, very, we were very well articulated and it's specifically this fact of, understanding the funding, understanding what it means to work with EU funding, um, that some are paid, some are not paid. And we were talking about that also in the workshops we were doing. We were paying the people there um, that came to the workshops because we knew that this is time that they're not, uh, not working and not engaging in their, uh, in their initiative. And that was also a um, very long conversation with the EU, of course, of why we are paying the workshop mm -hmm. participants. Yeah. yeah, so I'm a student, or I was a month ago student here, <laughs> just got a from a master's, um, and I was um, dealing with citizen science. So this is what brought me here today. Um, yeah, now my question is, but the last one that you said, first, first of all, um, how did you argument or do you 
you think it would have been possible that to keep people engaged without paying them? Would it be possible? Would you, would you expect the same results, or was it like really significant? Uh, yeah. We were paying them for certain workshops. Mm -hmm. We were not paying them to engage with the technology. So if, if they had just gone to the workshops and built the technology with us and then just left it in there, that would have, that would have been possible. Um, I think it would have been possible because a lot of research is being done with these groups and they're not being paid and they do it anyways. At that time when this happened, we had, as groups, actually made, um, we called it our own little union, because we were constantly being asked to perform in different, different um, settings to come and talk about our great projects and so on. So we, we said to each other that we will stop doing that unless we get paid. Not, of course, the pay would not come to us personally, but go to the initiative, but it would be a way for us to not feel bad about saying, yes, I can come to your lecture, yes, I can talk to your students, yes, I can do all of these things if you pay me, because we have decided as groups, as initiatives, that we only do this if we're getting paid. And it was easier than to say that, because, of course, it's highly uncomfortable to say that to a university or to whoever wants to engage with you. And so this was the point in time when this happened, when, when we got this funding, so it was then not a question, it was just very clear that we were going to pay them. Pay us. Yeah. And the second question, if I may, so you said, here was in the first project, you said how organically it, it was growing and all the hustle that it came with, and then I think one of your partners was more focused on publications, or? Yeah. So, yeah, how would your publications go in such like this uh, experimental research um, method? Yeah. This was a, the question of, of cultural, yes, this, cultural capital, mm -hmm. which was also a big conversation in the Mazi project of understanding what, what different kinds of cu currencies we have. So the currencies of the, of the initiatives is that they're doing this work, that they're doing this political work, that they're uh, becoming known, that, they're, that they can mobilize hundreds or, th or thousands of people to walk on the streets and so on and so forth. That is their currency, the knowledge that they're producing, doing this, uh, the policy documents that they're producing themselves and so on. This is their currency. Um, this, it's their legit legitimacy, it is their trustworthiness within the community and so on and so forth. That's the currency. For a researcher, it's not interesting for, like, as we don't get better status in our university if we can get 100 people to go to a demonstration. We get better status if we public, uh, publish a, a paper. So just making that clear that one person here has to write about this because otherwise he is not going to be able to to justify his his work and uh, I think it was that that clarity of talking about these kinds of currencies uh, and what do you do and how do you treat them how do you treat that kind of uh, how do you treat the data for example that we were producing during these workshops uh, a lot of the things that we produced within these workshops are authored by everybody in this workshop so any kind of um, prototypes we produce, or, or pictures, or diagrams, or uh, joint text that we wrote during these workshops, were always um, referred to with everybody as authors, for example. Of course, nobody cared in the room, because they think, like, yeah, who cares? But it was at least a way to show that it was not my work, it was not his work. It's this work that we did together. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the nice presentations and also for the insights. Um, I'm a PhD student and also doing research on the implementation of digital technologies. And I would be very interested in the intransparency that you mentioned. Um, that was kind of a starting point for the alliance that you um, built. How, how did you deal with that? Like, um, was there like kind of approach that you used for it or how did you make it transparent? Um, and then I have a second question, but then 
So this was um, the intransparency by by the Senate department mm -hmm. that was heading the digital strategy process. I think they were just completely surprised that anybody was interested at all, first of all. Um, that it was just like what we, I mean, and to tell you the truth, if they had done this strategy 2016, nobody would have been interested in it. But it happened in 2018 and Barcelona had happened and Francesca Bria had been there and Da -da 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 -da, all of a sudden it started to be, and of course the Mazi project had done marvelous stuff, but um, it had become an issue and uh, um, so they were first of all surprised and uh, it took a lot of time to get them to understand that we were not there to boycott them or to um, only criticize them or to protest against them. We were very open with that we were very happy that finally a uh, digital strategy was happening, just we needed it to be more public. And it was a lot of work of building trust with these mm -hmm. um, political administration people. That was a big learning and a big failure, I would say, of the alliance, or, or a big learning. Um, because we were really successful in building this trust and we could see that during the, the two round tables that we had that that they were really telling each other that you can go to this, this is a really productive space and, uh, and they all engaged and everybody we invited um, from the administration came to the round tables and, and presented and so on and they felt, they felt it was a safe space and then came the election and then everybody was gone, like everybody was gone that we had spoken with. So the entire, like that entire riga of people were gone. And then a year later, the second election happened and now they're even more gone <laughs> because, uh, because of the government. So this was, um, I mean, what we were piloting with the, with the round table was a kind of institutionalized form of participation, but it was still our institutionalized form. It was not that they had institutionalized it in their in their um, in their structures, so this is like very obvious that you need you cannot you cannot build this kind of uh, a relationship with people. You have to build it on a structural level. Um, so right now, the the city alliance. I mean, now for the last two months since we have a new government, sort of again. Um, we're not sure exactly how to move, but we're looking more into, again, going back, not try, not directly engaging with the administration, but instead saying, okay, let's look at what kind of um, digital projects that we can start doing to create concrete policy, uh, concrete policy recommendations and say, this is what we need, and we don't care who you are, but this is what we need. <laughs> so, uh, sort of like bouncing back between these levels. It's more a comment than a question to um, that there are many sources of feeling unco uncomfortable in this field uh, because there are so many clashes between different spheres of activity. So uh, this publication need was mentioned. I, I think you do your PhD besides doing project management work. So all, all the translation processes is, is what, what uh, project management managers tell me about their work. There are different spheres they have to tackle um, and have to deal with. So, so uh, then there is funding for project that end, uh, and so on. So there, there are many things or many aspects that, that make academic work inapt for such or unsuitable for such a kind of hmm. taking or for, or for taking such a role that that you both describe as, as something more not just as engaged scholarship or something like that. So hmm. that's just that came to my mind. I'm coming to that also I was uh, thinking because this is basically my concern so I wanted to hear from you two um, that if you do fundamental fundamental research, like academic research and these works, have you also faced with some awkwardness in the in the field from uh, people who are doing the 
conventional, tr traditional qualitative research on uh, not being objective or, uh, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, and it's, it's hard to generalize that, you know, the things that uh, traditional um, qualitative research um, uh, evaluate the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, and then yeah, there's people that can that can convince that you know that object, uh, you know that. Uh, uh, yeah, there's people that you can convince that uh, you know uh, feminist objectivity is uh, is uh, the standpoint theory is right, and that you know knowledge is performative, and that we all you know we're all situated and. Um, and need to account for our perspectives and that object. Yeah, and there's people that you won't convince, and, and uh, it's something that's hard to navigate sometimes. But um, I was fortunate doing a PhD that I had uh, really strong um, support from my, my mentors and my uh, my supervisors, and um, and that I've, I've you know uh, found and navigated academic communities that really I recognize the the work, um, and I encounter those at John time. <laughs> mm, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I, uh, the Weizenbaum Institute is a very interdisciplinary institute. Uh, when my main part there, we were 20 groups, um, research groups with everything from um, law to informatics to sociology to what have you. And when we came in, our group coming from design research, I'm not a design researcher, but a uh, political uh, science background, um, it was very much frowned upon, not frowned upon, but like at least not at all understanding what we were doing there um, and the research we were doing. But that acceptance has grown, exactly as you say, by some people. <laughs> and by some, you, you will not, you will not um, be able to persuade. But I think this, and this is, I think, what, what I meant in the beginning, so nice to be in a room when you can actually talk about it openly, uh, because of course it's something that we're going to be constantly confronted with, and how can we build like the stance of making it clear, and making, make, stand, standing for it, and not trying to just like justify it by finding nice theories, but saying that, yeah, well, this is the, the, my motivation to do research is, is because I see this need. Yeah.